Part 11 of This is the End by Stella Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. When Jay, very wet and dazed, reached 18 Mabel Place, she found a card pushed under the door. The name on it was Mr. Herbert Russell's, and there was a suggestion in a beautiful little handwriting on the back of it that she should ring him up next morning and tell him when to come and see her, as he had a message from her brother. "'This is the sort of thing that couldn't possibly happen in real life,' said Jay. "'I must be drunk after all. On no doorstep except heavens could one find a message so romantic.' She was instinctively disobedient to older and wiser people. She never entertained the idea of telephoning. She could imagine Mr. Russell answering the telephone in a prosaic voice like a double bass. She wrote the following letter. Dear Sir, Don't you remember I was to meet you anyway on the steps of St. Paul's at ten o'clock next Sunday? I will wait till then for the message. Yours faithfully, Jane Elizabeth Martin, Bus Conductor. That letter ought to put two and two together for him, she thought, if he hasn't done it already. It's a complicated little sum, and the result is... What? She felt hot and feverish when she wrote the letter, and directly she had posted it, she regretted having done so. I forget what I wrote, she said. It is dangerous to post letters to older and wiser men when drunk. All that night she lay awake and mourned the desertion of her secret friend. You promised war and thunder and romance. You promised true, but we were very blind and very young and in our ignorance we never called to mind that truth is seldom kind. You promised love, immortal as a star. You promised true, yet how the truth can lie! For now we grope for hands where no hands are, and deathless still we cry, nor hope for a reply. You promised harvest and a perfect yield. You promised true, for on the harvest morn, behold, a reaper strode across the field, and man of woman born was gathered in as corn. You promised honor and ordeal by flame. You promised true. In joy we trembled lest we should be found unworthy when it came. But, oh, we never guessed the fury of the test. You promised friends and songs and festivals. You promised true. Our friends, who still are young, assemble for their feasting in those halls where speaks no human tongue. And thus... Our songs are sung. I have very rarely found Sunday in London a successful day. I hate idleness without peace, and festivity without beauty, and noise without music. I hate to see London people in unnatural clothes. I hate to see a city holding its breath. Jay waited ten minutes on the steps of St. Paul's for Mr. Russell. This was not because he was late, but because she was early. And this again was not because she was indecently eager, but because she had hit on an unexpectedly non-stop bus. She felt a fool for ten minutes. And when you have waited ten minutes on those enormous steps under the eye of the pigeons, you will know why she felt a fool. Mr. Russell arrived in Christina, the motor-car, and simultaneously a shower fell. From the first moment, Jay felt unsuccess in the air of that much-anticipated day. 
she was introduced to Christina and said, But we can't take that thing into the cathedral. We don't want to, said Mr. Russell, although, as he was a born driver, the challenge made him instinctively measure with his eye the depth of the steps and the width of the doorway from Christina's point of view. We don't want to pray, we want to talk. Anonyma would have been astonished to hear him say this. As a matter of fact, said Jay, I brought Chloris for the same reason. Chloris was eating the bread which a kind but short-sighted old lady believed herself to be giving to the pigeons. Mr. Russell had hardly been able to imagine his bus conductor in any dress but that of her calling. Now that he saw her in unambitious London-colored things, he was glad to notice that her clothes were not Sunday clothes, but the sort that you forget about directly you look away from them. This was the sort of day that breaks up delusions, and as Christina the motor-car started away, Jay discovered that her hat was not adequately attached to her head. There are few discoveries more depressing than this at the beginning of a day of movement. The bells of St. Paul's began to sing. Little fairy bells dodged behind and about the great notes, but Christina soon swept the sound into the forgotten air behind her. "'I've got a lot to talk to you about,' said Mr. Russell, as he headed Christina Hackney way. He was conscious that he was taking his miracle curiously for granted. I don't think he really believed in it yet. For Mr. Russell, all truth was haunted by the ghost of a clanking lie. He discerned deceit on the part of Providence, where no deceit was. I'll give you your brother's message first, because it interests me personally least. He is gone. There was a sudden move across the channel last week, and he went, I suppose, ten days ago now. The message he hadn't time to give you was an appeal to give up bus conducting. He had an absurd idea that you walked out with men conductors in Victoria Park. Not at all absurd, said Jay, not half so absurd as the idea of driving out with a casual fare. I know some delightful conductors and drivers. We joke together when the traffic sticks. There is one perfect darling called Edward. His only fault is that he drives a mere steamer. But we always bow, and once when a horse fell down and we got hung up for twenty minutes in the strand, he sang me a little song about a star. Mr. Russell listened to all this very attentively, and then continued, "'Your brother wants you to go back to your family. His last words to me about it were that if you could manage to be ladylike for three years or the duration of war, at the end of that time he and you would go and live by your two selves in New Zealand, and if you liked you need wear no skirts at all there but riding breeches all the time.' "'Ladylike,' snorted Jay. What's the use of ladyliquity, even for five minutes? So Q sent you as an antidote. I suppose he didn't know you were one of my fares. A fare, said Mr. Russell sententiously, may, I suppose, be a wonderful revelation, because you only see your fare's eyes for a second, and the things you may see have no limit, and you never know the silly little truth about him. Yet even so, there is more than a ticket and a look between you and me, and you know it. Possibly there is a secret world between you and me, said Jay, but that's a pretty big thing to divide us. Supposing it doesn't divide us, said Mr. Russell, looking fiercely at the road in front of him. Supposing it showed me how much I love you. How disappointing, said Jay in the worst of possible taste. She was like that today. You're ceasing to be an older and wiser, and trying to become an ordinary nearer and dearer. Oh, curse, she thought in brackets, I shall kick myself tonight. That's a horrid thing to say, said Mr. Russell, but still, I do love you. 
It sounds very Victorian and nice, said Jay, wondering if he could still see her through her veil of bad temper. But, you know, in spite of secret worlds and secret souls and centuries of secret knowledge, we still have to keep up this 1916 farce and leave something of ourselves in sensible London. How do I know you're not married? Mr. Russell thought for a very long time indeed, and then said, I am. Jay was not very well brought up. She did not stop the car and step out with dignity into respectable hackney. She was just silent for a long time. As you were, she said to herself when she found herself able to think again, this is a bad day, but it will be over in something less than a hundred years. You drive well, she said presently, looking with relief from Mr. Russell's face to his hands. Christina, the motor-car, and two buses were just then indulging in a figure like the opening steps of the grand chain. You drive as though driving were poetry, and every mile a verse. After all, she told herself, the man loves me, and I must at least take an intelligent interest in him. Are you a poet? she added. Nobody had ever asked Mr. Russell this question before, and not knowing the answer to it, he did not answer. I have never written a line of poetry, said Jay, or rather, I have several times written a line, but never another line to fit it. Yet, because I have a friend, I know in what curious and extended order the verses come, and how the tunes come first, and the various voices next, and the words last, and how a good rhyme warms you like a fire, and how the tunes fall away when the thing is finished, and how ready-made it all is, really, and yet how tired you feel. To Mr. Russell it all seemed true, and part of the miracle. He had nothing to add, and therefore added nothing. "'Obviously you are a poet,' said Jay. "'You have a poetic look.' "'What look is that?' asked Mr. Russell, much pleased. It was twenty years since he had even remembered that he possessed a look of his own. A silly, sullen look, said Jay. Presently, she added, But it must have been disappointing to find yourself a poet in Victorian times. I always think of you olders and wisers as coming out of your stuffy nineteenth century into our nice new age with a sigh of relief. Oh, no, said Mr. Russell. You must remember that when we were born into it, it became our nice new age, and therefore to us there is no age like it. It seems incredible, said Jay. Did older and wiser people ever live violently, ever work, work hard, until their brains were blind and they cried because they were so tired? Did they ever get drowned in seas full of foaming ambitions? Did they ever fight without dignity but with joy for a cause? Did they ever shout and jump with joy in their pajamas in the moonlight? Did they ever feel just drunk with being young and in at the start? And were older and wiser people's jokes ever funny? We were fools often, said Mr. Russell. Once, when I was fifteen, I bit my hand, and here is the scar, because I thought I had found a new thing in life, and I thought I was the first discoverer. But as to jokes, you are on very dangerous ground there. One's sense of humor is a more tender point than one's heart, especially an older and wiser sense of humor. You know, we think the jokes of your nice new age not half so funny as ours. But as neither you nor I make jokes, that obstacle need not come between us. Oh, I think difference of date is never in itself an obstacle, said Jay. Time is not important enough to be an obstacle. 
You and I know that, said Mr. Russell. A little unnoticed knot of Salvationists surprised Jay at a distance by singing the tune of a sentimental song popular five years ago, and then they surprised her again as she passed them and heard the words to which the tune was being sung. Brimstone had usurped the place of the roses in that song, and the love left in it was not apparently the kind of love that Hackney understands. "'Why don't they sing the old hymn tunes?' asked Jay, or tunes like Abide With Me, not very old or very good, but worn down with devotion, like the steps of an old church. Why do they take the drama out of it all?' Chloris at that moment introduced drama into the drive by jumping out of the back seat of Christina. I must, I suppose, admit that Chloris was not really quite a lady. On the contrary, motor buses were the only motors she knew. She mistook the estimable Christina for a deformed motor bus, and when she smelt Victoria Park she jumped out. Even for Chloris this was an unsuccessful day. A flash of yelping lightning caught the tail of Jay's eye, and she looked round to see her dignified dog, upside down, skit violently down a steep place into the gutter, and there disappear beneath the skirt of a female stranger who was poised upon the curb. Unhurt but probably blushing furiously beneath her fur over her own vulgarity, Chloris was retrieved, and spent the rest of the drive in wiping all traces of the accident off her ribs onto the cushions of Christina. I am glad that Mr. Russell's hound was not there to witness poor Chloris's unsophisticated confession of caste. "'Where are we going?' asked Jay, when she was calm again. "'God knows where,' said Mr. Russell. I'm always coming across districts of that name, said Jay severely. I often direct my inquiring fares to the region of God knows where. It is most unsatisfying. Where are we going? On forever, said Mr. Russell, out of the world, to the house by the sea. Then will you please set me down at Baker's Arms, said Jay. Do you know, by the way, that Anonyma always says stay to a bus, if she remembers in time not to say hi stop like a common person. She was talking desperately against failure, but it seemed a doomed day, and nothing she could think of seemed worth saying. I want to talk to you about your house by the sea, said Mr. Russell. You know I found it. Don't tell me any facts, implored Jay. Don't tell me you pressed half a crown into the palm of the oldest and wisest inhabitant, and found out facts about some nasty young man who was born in seventeen-something, and lived in a place called Atlantic View, and wore curls and a choky stock, and fought at Waterloo, and lies in the village church under a stone monstrosity. Don't tell me facts, because I know they will bar me forever out of my house by the sea. Facts are contraband there. There is no house by that sea now, said Mr. Russell. A slate quarry has devoured the headland on which it used to stand. Where the house used to be, there is air now. I dare say the ghosts you knew still trace out the shape of the house in the air. The ghosts I know, corrected Jay, don't put it in the past. It's all in the past, said Mr. Russell. It's all a dream, and an echo, and the ghost of the day before yesterday. How do you know? asked Jay. How can you tell it's not 1916 that's the ghost? She had been taught by her friend to take very few things for granted, and time least of all. I asked you to tell me no facts, she added. I'll only tell you two, persisted Mr. Russell. One is that they have in the church near the quarry a dark wooden figure of a saint, with the raised arm broken and straight draperies. I saw it, and they told me what I knew already, that it came out of the hall of a house that was drowned in the sea. 
The other fact is a story that the tobacconist told me, about a wriggly ladder and stone balls and the law. In the tobacconist's childhood they found the stone balls at the foot of the cliff in the sand. That story, too, I knew already. Quite apart from your letters, you little secret friend, I knew the face of that sea directly I saw it. But how did you know? How dared you know? Oh, well, said Mr. Russell, you asked me to tell you no facts. Mr. Russell was not observant. He was not sufficiently alive to be observant. He was much occupied in remembering phantom yesterdays, and I do not think he listened very much to what the bus conductor said. He only enjoyed the sound of her voice, which he remembered. So he did not know that she was unhappy. They came presently to a separate part of the forest, which is impaled upon a straight white road. The earth beneath the trees was caught in a mesh of shadows. The trees are high and vaulted there, but the forest is very reticent. The detail of its making is so small that you can only see it if you lie down on your face. Do this, and you can see the green threads of the earth's material woven across the skeletons of last year's leaves. You can see the little lawns of moss and weeds, too small to name, that make the way brilliant for the ants. You can watch the heroic armored beetles defying their world. You can cover with a leaf the great open-air public meeting-places of six-legged things. You can see the spiders at work on their silver cranes. You can watch the bold elevated activities of the caterpillars. You can feel the scattered grasses stroke your eyelids. You can hear the low songs of fairies among the roots of the trees. All these things you may enjoy if you lie down, but the forest does not show them to you. The forest pays you the great compliment of ignoring you, and it does not care whether you see its intimate possessions or not. I think perhaps no day is really unsuccessful that gives you forest earth against your forehead, and forest grass between your fingers, and high forest trees to stand between you and the ultimate confession of failure. Jay and Mr. Russell boarded out Christina the motor car for the day at an inn, and then they sat and gradually introduced themselves to the forest. Showers fell on their hatless heads, and they did not notice. A mole rose like a submarine from the waves of the forest earth, and they did not notice. The butterflies danced like little tunes in the sunlit clearing, and they did not notice. And from a long way off, near the swings, holiday shrieks trailed along the wind, and they did not notice. Jay told Mr. Russell, one by one, small, unmattering things that she remembered out of her secret world. And each time when she had told him, he wondered with regret why he had not remembered it by himself. He had never thought it worth while to remember before. His imagination was crippled and needed crutches. He had not thought it worth while to think much about the time when he was young, the time when his past had been as big and shining as his future. The longer we live, it seems, the less we remember, and no men, and few women, normally possess a secret story after thirty. It would not matter so much if you only lost your story. A worse fate than loss befalls it. You laugh at it. It is curious how the world draws in as one gets older and wiser. The past catches one up, the future burns away like a candle. I used to think that growing up was like walking from one end of a meadow to the other. I thought that the meadow would remain, and one had only to turn one's head to see it all again. 
But now I know that growing up is like going through a door into a little room, and the door shuts behind one. I think Mr. Russell's point of difference from most older and wiser people was that he had not forgotten the excitement of writing down snatches of his secret story as it came to him, and the passion of tearing up the thing that he wrote, and the delight of finding that he could not tear it out of his heart. He was a silent person, and a rather neglected person, and unbusinesslike, and unsuccessful, and uncultured, and unsociable, and unbeautiful. So there was nothing worse than emptiness where his secret story used to be. He had not found it worth while to fill the space. He had not found it worth while to shut the door. Do you remember that Christmas, said Jay, when there was a blizzard and a great sea, and the foam blinded the western windows of the house, and the children went out to sing, Love and Joy Come to You? Those aren't real words any more now, are they? Only pretty caricatures. And when the children came in with snow and foam plastered up their windward sides, do you remember that one of them said, Is this what Lot's wife felt like? I can just remember love and joy mixed up with the wind at the window, said Mr. Russell. But always, best of all, I can remember the way you looked on. Me? said Jay. I wasn't there. Oh, yes, you were. And that's what you forget. You were there always. And when I was looking for the house, I believe it was always you I was expecting to find there. Me? Me with this same old face? gasped Jay. Oh, excuse me, but you lie. You never recognized me in my bus. I knew without knowing I knew. I remembered without remembering that I remembered. We haven't made a psychical discovery, Jay. We have done nothing to write a book about. Only you remember so well that you have reminded me. I don't believe that can be true, said Jay. I know I wasn't there. Why can't you see the truth of it? asked Mr. Russell, sighing for so many words wasted. In that house by the sea, who was your secret friend? My friend, said Jay, is young and very full of youth. He is like a baby who knows life and yet finds it very amusing and very new. He is without the gift of rest, but then he does not need it. The world in which he lives is not so tired and not so muddling as our world. In him my only belief and my only color and my last dregs of romance and certainly my youth survive. We never bother about reserve, and we never mind being sentimental in my secret world. We just live, and we are never tortured by the futility of knowledge. Well, said Mr. Russell, I had a secret friend in my house, and she was wonderful, because she was so young that she knew nothing. She never asked questions, but she thought questions. She knew nothing. She was waiting to grow up. She had little color, only peace and promise. I knew she would grow up, but I also knew she would never grow old. I knew she would learn much, but I also knew she would never become complete and ask no more questions. That voice of hers would always end on a questioning note. You see, I have found my secret friend, grown up, grown old enough to enjoy and understand a new and more vital youth. Shall I find my friend? asked Jay. Yes, said Mr. Russell, in a very low voice. You can find him if you look. You can find him grown very old and ugly and tired. There are different ways of growing up, and your secret friend was rash in using up too great a share of his sum of life in the house by the sea. 
Then Jay was suddenly enormously happy, and the veil of failure fell away from the day and from her life. She held in her hand incredible coincidences. The angle of the forest, the upright trees upon the sloping earth, the bend of the sky, the round bubble shapes of the clouds upon their appointed way, the agreement of the young leaves one with another, the unfailing pulse of the spring. All these things seemed to her a chance, an unlikely and perfect consummation, that had been reached only by the extraordinary cleverness of God. All love and all success were pressed into a hair's breadth, and yet the target was never missed. "'You shall go down to the house by the sea,' said Jay. "'You shall go when the moon is next full over the sea that drowned our house. "'You shall come from the east, along the rocky path, "'as you used to come between the foxgloves. "'You shall play at being a god, coming between the stars and the sea. "'And I will play at being a goddess, as I used to play at being a ghost, and I will run to meet you from the west, and the high grasses and the ferns shall whip my knees, and the thistles shall bow to me, and the sea shall be very calm and say no word, and there shall be no ship in sight. And we will go down the steep path to the shore, and we will stand where the sand is wet, and look up, to where our drowned house used to be. And there shall be no facts any more, only the ghosts and the dreams. Oh, surely it has never happened before, this meeting of secret friends, and surely no friend ever loved her friend as I love you, and surely there never was so little room for sin and disappointment in any love as there is in ours. Surely there are no tears in the world any more, and no brown burrow, and no war. I don't care if I go hungry every day till we meet. I don't care if I have nothing but hated clothes to wear in my secret world. I don't care if there are six changes on the journey to the sea, and at every change I miss my connection. I don't care if the end lasts only a minute, because the minute will last forever. There are no facts any more. Because of you, the little brothers of the world are gone, and the big brothers never did exist, because of you. Oh, I can say what I mean at last, and if it's nonsense, I don't care, because of you. Presently, she said, And now I wonder if I am very proud or very much ashamed of having spoken. You said once, Mr. Russell reminded her, that life was just a bead upon a string. Well, does it much matter whether one bead is the color of pride or the color of shame? Does one successful bead more or less matter, my dear? I think it's all a succession of explanations, more or less lucid, and all different, and all confusing. A string of beads, more or less beautiful, and all unvalued. We don't know that any of the explanations are true. We don't know that any of the beads have any worth. We only know that they are ours. I don't care if I trample my beads in the mud, said Jay. Now let's go home and think. End of Part 11